Now that we've looked at the radial probability density and the angular probability densities, um, let's look at the whole picture with both of those put together. So this gives us our familiar hydrogen atom orbitals that you know from general chemistry and organic chemistry. And what I have pictured here is cutaways of the three-dimensional um, S orbital. So remember that S means that L is equal to zero. And so we have no total angular momentum. And so these are spherically symmetric. So these are the S orbitals for the first three N quantum numbers, one, two, and three. So when we have a one S orbital, remember that in the radial probability density, there are no radial nodes. So if I start at the proton and I walk out to the outside of that spherical symmetric um, distribution in any direction, I will find that my probability goes from yellow being quite high all the way out to purple being um, close to zero. So once I get to zero, get close to zero, my um, probability density in, in these colors is purple. So I go from a um, nothing at the nucleus to a maximum, and then I start to decrease from yellow to green to blue to purple, and then and so I smoothly go from a maximum to a minimum, and there are no radial nodes. When I look at the 2s distribution, if I start at the nucleus and I walk out in any direction, I will have a maximum near the nucleus that's sort of yellowish green, but then I go to a minimum or a node at this distance away from the nucleus. So um, there is a node, a radial node, in this probability density. So we can see that there's sort of two shells, a shell of probability around the nucleus, and then another shell of probability where we have another maximum out here away from the nucleus. And then, so um, remember that our radial probability for n equals two had one radial node. And so in fact, we're going from the nucleus, we're crossing over to a um, node where the probability goes to zero, then we have another maximum, and then we <clears throat> go down to zero again. When n equals three, I should have two radial nodes. And so you'll see that if you start at the nucleus and you walk out in any direction, you will come to a node here where we have this dark blue, and then we get another maximum, and then we get another node here where this purple ring is, and then we go back out and we just slowly fade, our probability slowly fades back down to zero and asymptotically reaches zero at an infinite distance away from the nucleus. So this is where we get this idea that the, the, there are these electron shells. So we have a one shell. We have um, at n equals two has two shells in it, and n equals three has three shells in it. Next, let's look at the probability distributions for the L equals one or P orbitals. And again, we'll look at the different N quantum numbers, N equals two and N equals three. Remember that in N equals one, we cannot have an L equals one or a P orbital. So um, if we have L equals one, then we have um, possibilities of having N equals two, three, four, five, six, et cetera. When we have L equals one, we have a choice of different M quantum numbers. When M is plus or minus one, the probability distribution looks the same. Remember that the only difference is the direction that um, we go around. Remember that our familiar P orbitals from um, general chemistry and from organic chemistry are linear combinations of the plus M and the minus M um, orbitals that we see here. So if we think about the n equals two p orbitals, when l equals one and n equals two, we should have zero radial nodes. And so we think again, if we start at the nucleus and we walk out in any direction, we can see that we start at zero, we go through a maximum, and then we asymptotically reach zero again. And so there are no nodes in this, no radial nodes in this probability distribution. However, we expect to see one angular node, and you can see that if you 
slice the sphere along this plane that no matter where I walk out along that plane, I am going to get a zero probability. And so all along that plane, I have a zero probability. So that is an angular node. So we do expect that one angular node in our p orbitals. If we now look at the n equals three p orbitals for m equals one, we can see that the shape of this is basically the same, but now we have a radial node out here. So if we start at the nucleus, we go through a maximum, we come down to purple zero, and then again asymptotically reach zero as we go keep going out. So again, there's this shell structure where we have this dumbbell shape in the middle, and then we have another dumbbell shape around outside that. If I went to n equals four, I would have a dumbbell shape, another dumbbell shape, and another dumbbell shape. So I would just keep adding dumbbell shapes around the um, nucleus. So that's for m equals one. If I look at the m equals zero, remember that m equals zero is a pure eigenstate. It's not a superposition state. And so this is what we think of as our pz orbital. So again, it's basically exactly the same, but now I've just flipped the orientation from being in the xy plane to being along the z-axis. And I see this same shell distribution in the n equals three. So now let's look at the probability distribution of our familiar d orbitals. So this is an l equals two wave function. And I'm going to show you the d orbitals for n equals three. If we had n equals four, we would just have another radial node um, that we would see the same kind of shapes, but then with different shells outside of the, the shapes that we see here. So let's look at the pure eigenfunction first, the m equals zero or the dz squared, our familiar dz squared orbital. First, let's make sure that we can see how this shape gives us that shape that we always draw for the dz squared orbital where we have the um, two lobes and then we have the ring around the center. So the two lobes that we have here are these lobes along the z-axis. Notice that in this cutaway I've cut through the sphere but this ring around here is this probability that actually goes all the way around that sphere. So there's these two lobes and there's that sphere, that um, ring that goes all the way around the sphere. The interesting thing here is that when we look at this cutaway, we can see how this dz squared orbital actually has the same sort of structure in the cutaway as the other d orbitals where we have this clover leaf structure. And again, we can identify the fact that there are no radial nodes in this d n equals three d orbital, as we would expect. So if we start at the nucleus and we walk out, we get to a maximum where we have a um, fairly high probability and then our probability begins to fade down towards the light blue, and if we kept going out, it would go all the way to purple and asymptotically reach zero. So we have no radial nodes, no matter which direction we walk out along the um, radius of a sphere. However, we have two angular nodes. So again, we can draw ourselves some planes, but in this dz squared orbital, that those planes are actually cones of um, that encompass these lobes that go along the z-axis. So if I walk anywhere out along this cone, I will have a zero probability anywhere on the surface of that cone. So those cones are angular nodes. If I look then at the m equals plus or minus one and the m equals plus or minus two distributions, again, plus and minus one are the same and plus and minus two are the same. It's just about the direction in which we travel in the, um, within those lobes. 
So here in the m equals plus or minus one, we can clearly see these this cloverleaf um, distribution, and we can easily see that we have these angular nodes, one along this plane and one along this plane. So two angular nodes and no radial nodes. And again, we have the same thing in the m equals two distribution where we have um, two angular nodes, one along a plane here and one along a plane that goes back into the um, drawing. Notice for the m equals plus or minus one that our lobes are in between the principal axes in the Cartesian direction. And so if I draw in my axes, this is z, this is y, and this is x, and each of those lobes is in, um, in a quadrant or an octant of the Cartesian directions. However, if I look at the m equals plus or minus two, I have my z direction here, I have my y direction here, and my x direction here, and we can see that the lobes are actually on the axes rather than between the axes. So when I take the m equals plus or minus one and I do my linear combinations, I get the dxz and the dyz orbitals. And when I do linear combinations of the plus or minus two, I get the dxy and the dx squared minus y squared combinations.